Two days ago, a murder case occurred here. The deceased was a male, found completely naked, in a small hotel. He died a gruesome death, with a hotel towel stuffed in his mouth, his men's tied to the four corners of the bed, and his abdomen split open from the chest down. The strangest part is that a teddy bear was stuffed inside his stomach. I was shocked when I saw this news. Because the deceased was someone I knew you. His name was Edward Norton, but we all called him Dit. He was actually quite nice to his buddies. Although he didn't have much money, he was loyal. However, he couldn't control his lower body. Reportedly jailed twice. Both times related to women. I met him while working on a construction site. Once when we were fighting with a group of outsiders, I took a brick for him. Since then he called me his brother. Whenever we got paid, he would always invite me to relax together. Our usual spot was a small hotel hidden in an old residential area, so small that the entrance was barely visible. He was a regular there, saying the owner only cared about collecting money and didn't ask questions. There was no need for registration or surveillance, and most importantly, the place had multiple escape routes in case of trouble. Despite working on a construction site, we were also afraid of getting caught. It would mean a hefty fine and losing work days, thus reducing our wages. The day before yesterday, it wasn't pain day, but he suddenly asked me out to have fun. At the time, I joked, if he had found money. He just smiled without answering and handed me a pack of good cigarettes. I thought, why not go if it's free? But I didn't expect such a big incident. Seeing the pixelated images online made me extremely anxious. Not just disgusted, but also scared, but also scared. Visiting prostitutes was one thing, but his death was related to me. Damn it. If I had known the consequences would be so severe, I would never have listened to that woman. Coincidentally, a day before, a strange woman came to me. She asked if I was close to Edward Morton. Seeing her clean and refined look, unlike anyone in our circle, I admitted out of vanity that we were friends. She gave me one hundred dollars, asking for a favor. She had a grudge against Edward Norton and wanted to get back at him. She asked me to inform her the next time we went to the hotel, promising I wouldn't be implicated. I refused her at first but she offered another two hundred dollars after the job, and I was tempted. For people like us, getting caught was no big deal. At most, we'd say we had no money, and we might only be detained for half a month. Once he got out, I could treat him to a good meal. After all, no one would refuse money. When he set out that day, I informed the woman of our whereabouts. Both Ed and I booked separate rooms, and then the woman arrived. She kept her word handing me $200 immediately. But then she gave me a bottle of water, asking me to give it to Anne, saying it just make him drowsy and sleep. She was afraid he might run before the police arrived. Thinking the money was already in my hands, I reluctantly gave the water to it, saying it was to enhance the fun, suggesting we could swap later. After handing over the water, I took the money and left. When didn't return the next day, I thought he was caught until I saw the news. I didn't expect it to be this serious. It was too late to regret it. For three hundred dollars, I not only got him killed, but also implicated myself. I considered turning myself into the police. I was an unintentional accomplice, but if I turned myself in, I might get leniency. 
while hesitating that woman came to find me again. Seeing her, I was furious. Ed had been good to me, but now he was dead, and in such a horrific manner. Did you do it? Why did you kill it? Key. She smiled, yes. I stood there speechless. Her eyes stared at me, making me shiver. And the woman gun. Hmm. A loud bang sounded in my head. I had thought the water was just a sedative, not knowing what it really was. You gave it to me. Oh, really? Guess whose fingerprints are on it? She did follow the victims. I couldn't speak. You're framing me. I don't care. I'll turn myself in and tell the truth. The police will give me leniency. Leniency, understand this. The person was contacted by you, and you delivered the water. Even if I hired someone to kill you, or the weapon, do you think you'll get leniency or 20 years? My mind went blank. I lowered my voice, but if he was already dead, why do you have to do that to him? Recalling the online photos made my stomach churn. Her face suddenly changed, eyes bulging as if about to pop out. He deserved it. Do you know what he did? People like him don't deserve an intact corpse. I didn't dare respond or look into her eyes. I wondered what Ed had done to make her hate him so much. But now... What should I do? Turn myself in or pretend nothing happened? A gust of wind passed my ear. The woman lying closer. Now you have only one path. Follow me to the end. Only I can ensure your safety. You're already on the boat. Do you want to get off? I couldn't imagine what awaited me, but I knew I couldn't end up in a cold prison cell. I still had unfinished business. Closing my eyes, I sighed deeply. Fine, I'll pretend I know nothing. She laughed in satisfaction. You must be disobedient with the police too. Before leaving, she glanced around. Did Edward Norton leave anything behind? Something what thing? Nitri. She bit her lip. If you find anything, give it to me. Remember, it's crucial for what we need to do next. If the police get it, and I'm exposed, you won't have a good outcome, either. I didn't understand what she Not long after she left, I was still recovering, when there was a knock on the door, and two strangers appeared. A tall, thin young man who looked freshly graduated and an older man whose eyes seemed to see through people. They showed me their police badges. The young officer was Josh, who, and the older one, was Terni Ta. Are you Ethan Moon? Ooh. I nodded. We're from the city police department. We need to ask you about Edward Norton. You've heard right. The police indeed came quickly. They got straight to the point, asking about Ed. From Ed's usual behavior, the people we interacted with, to recent events, and even if I had been to that place with Ed, I told them everything, honestly. I knew that the more truthful I was, the fewer flaws there would be. The only thing I couldn't mention was that I was there that day. Finally, they asked about the day in question. I said he told me he was bored, and asked if I wanted to join him. I said I had no money, so he went alone, and I didn't know what happened after that. Where did you go afterward? Tangi Tao's eyes were like a hawk's. I went to the park near the construction site, idly browsing my phone, 
and watched people fish until about nine in the evening before returning. After leaving that night, I was anxious and didn't go back to the dorm directly. Instead, I wandered in the park for a long time, indeed, watching people fish, which served as my alibi. Two fishermen argued that day. An old man occupied too much space. The one next to him was annoyed, and their lines got tangled. It almost fought, and the park security came. As I was vividly describing the details, Josh, who interrupted, we'll verify the details. I was left awkwardly hanging with Tommy Tao staring at me for a long time, but not asking further questions. They rummaged through the dorm. Are all Edward Norton's things here? I quickly confirmed, and they took some of Edward's belongings and left. Before leaving, Tony Tao asked for my phone number, saying they might contact me again if needed. After they left, I felt my legs go weak. Tony Tao's gaze was terrifying. I almost slipped up, but luckily I got through it. Calming down, I began to reconsider everything. Both the woman and the police seemed to be looking for something from it. Oh. What could it be? Would this thing be the reason? Was killed. Though I had tastefully joined the woman's plan, I didn't want to be kept in the dark and used. I needed to find it before they did. Recalling E. Yeats' known her lifestyle, if he had something, it must be in the dorm. The police seemed to have found nothing. Where could it be? Then I remembered and once borrowed my suitcase. I quickly retrieved the suitcase from the corner and searched thoroughly, finally finding an old phone in a hidden compartment. This phone wasn't mine. My heart pounded as I wondered what was inside. I charged it and turned it on. Luckily, there was no password. After a few taps, I found the video. The video was named Catherine Joe. Opening the video, shocking scene appeared. The camera switched from Edward Norton's face to a woman in front of him. She looked under thirty eyes closed, showing no reaction the entire time. Looking closely, her belly seemed slightly swollen. The video lasted over three minutes, ending with Ed's satisfied expression as he turned off the phone. It was clearly a video of him, drugging and graping, a woman named Catherine Jo. Damn it, even though he shrieked me like a brother, I couldn't accept this, especially since she was pregnant. I didn't know what happened to Catherine Jo afterward, but the video was over two years old. He had kept it all this time. He once told me it was his gold mine. Had he been using this video to blackmail her? I felt a chill, suddenly understanding why the mysterious woman said he deserved to die. In our hometown, someone like him would be beaten to death. But now, what should I do? Hand the phone to the police. I didn't know the woman's relationship with Catherine Jill, but the police might trace her through the video implicating me. I couldn't imagine languishing in a dark prison. While I was lost in thought, the mysterious woman called again. You found it, didn't you? Cold sweat broke out instantly. My heart raced. How did she know? I just found the phone. Never mind how I know. You guessed. Right. This is why... Edward Norton deserved to die. I stayed silent for a while, then asked, Who is Catherine Jo? Didn't. She was my sister. I realized the woman, indeed, resembled Catherine Jo from the video. Is she okay? My heart jolted. My sister, who I depended on, 
was three months pregnant when Edward Norton raped her. Unable to bear the shame, she jumped from the 28th floor, carrying her unborn child. Do you think Edward Norton's death was unjust? A week before she died, she bought her baby, its first toy, a plush bear. Now I understood everything. The woman killed Edward Norton in that manner out of grief. I could empathize and deeply sympathize with her loss. Thank you for your help. Before I could respond, she added, so I plan to give you a big gift. A big gift? What? I had a bad feeling. I'll give you $10,000, but you need to make a call for me. $10,000 for making a call. I couldn't believe my ears. But she sounded serious. Do you remember when Edward Norton would suddenly have money? Sir, surname. I recalled and seemed to come into money unexpectedly, not just that day, but before as well. Holding the old phone, an idea flashed in my mind. You mean you use this video? But your sister is dead. Yes, but the person who made him do it isn't. I was stunned the person who made him do it. Now, you just need to make a call and this matter and exchange the phone for $10,000. She gave me her phone number. I hesitated feeling the situation was more complex than she said, but $10,000 was too tempting. With that money, I could escape all this and deep down a voice told me to end it. Finally, I dialed the number. Hello, is this I being fine? I'm Edward Norton's friend. I think you might be looking for something. There was silence on the other end. Then she asked if anyone else knew. I said I was Edward Norton's co-worker, found the phone while sorting his belongings, and her number was the only one saved. She asked how much I wanted. I said $10,000. She bargained, but I didn't budge. Eventually, she agreed asking for time to prepare and warning me not to tell anyone. I ring Fen, and I arranged to meet the next evening in an abandoned housing area on the outskirts where she would bring cash, and I would bring the phone. Judging by her voice, I wing feigned, seemed young, almost cheerful, perhaps relieved by Edward Norton's death. I asked the mysterious woman where Wu Yi Fang would do this, but she didn't answer, telling me to find out myself. The next day, I nervously changed clothes, packed a bag, and took several buses to the meeting spot. At the appointed time, I saw a figure approaching on a pink electric scooter. Getting off, I saw she was a girl in her early twenties, tall, pretty, a typical campus beauty. I couldn't understand how such a girl got involved with Ed nor what dark past lay behind her pretty face. She cautiously examined me from a distance, asking, Are you Ethan Woom? I said yes. She looked around to ensure I was alone before parking and walking over. My friend is nearby. If I don't return in 20 minutes, he'll alert the police with your information, so don't try anything. After we trade, we'll act like we never met. I smirked if she really had backup. Why would she come on a scooter alone? Besides, who would involve someone else in such a matter. But I didn't expose her. I just wanted the money, nothing else mattered. Irene Fung cautiously approached, reaching out for the phone. I said, where's the money? She disdainfully tossed her bag to me. I handed her the phone, opened the bag, and saw ten bundles of hundred dollar bills. I didn't count them just stuffed them into my bag. Irene Fang quickly checked the phone, then restored it to factory settings, 
erasing everything. You didn't make any copies, did you? She asked, sitting beside me. I shook my head. I wouldn't do that. The phone was Eads, and I don't want to get involved. Who didn't tell anyone? No, once I get the money, I'll leave. No one will know. She seemed in a good mood, even striking up a conversation. How did you find out? Did Edward Norton tell you? No, I found it by chance. Your number was the only one saved, so I thought you'd be interested. If only Edward Norton were as honest as you. Do you know how many times he blackmailed me? I'm so glad he's dead. I couldn't understand why she spoke of death so lightly. Despite Ed's actions, wasn't she the instigator? I suddenly felt disgusted by her. Despite her appearance, her thoughts were as venomous as a snake. All light were even. You go your way, I go mine. We each start anew. As I was about to leave, she suddenly called out. Ethan Wu, you remind me of someone. Her green eyes stared intently, making me blush. I have a common face. Nice working with you. She extended her hand for a handshake. I didn't know why she showed such a drastic change from cautious to friendly, but I just want to end it quickly and leave. So I shook her hand. Her hand was soft, but gripped mine tightly with an ambiguous look in her eyes. I looked away, trying to pull back when her other hand suddenly drew a syringe from her pocket and jabbed it into my chest. I barely reacted before the needle pierced my skin. Instinctively, I twisted away the needle, scraping a blood trail on me but I felt a cold liquid entering my chest. Irene Fan, what did you inject me with? The yin. My vision blurred, and my body went limp. Her expression turned from coy to fierce, her green eyes glaring. I'm done with that bastard. Only the dead keep secrets. As my consciousness faded, I saw her approaching a cold glint in her hand. With my last bit of will I dodged, her second stab, realizing she now held a knife. Missing the first strike, she raised the knife again. I lay powerless on the ground. I even find wasn't hurting my sister enough. You really are a snake. The mysterious woman's voice echoed. I looked around. Searching for her. Irene Fong froze at the voice. Who? She trembled. I finally saw the mysterious woman's shadow behind her. Do you see she's a snake? She hurt my sister and now wants to kill you. What are you waiting for? Kill her. Both Irene Fang and I heard the woman. Startled, she looked back. Using the moment, I grabbed her hand, turning it, and pushed her down. Food. I heard the knife sink into flesh. Irene Fang twitched on the ground, then lay still. I finally closed my eyes. When I awoke, I was leaning against the wall. I me, Fong, me lay motionless, a bit away. The mysterious woman stood beside her, smirking. Blood seat from my wing fang's chest. I crawled over and checked her breathing. It was faint. Panicking, I reached for my phone to call an ambulance, but my hand froze. A strange thought occurred. Turning to the woman, I asked, What's Irene Fang's connection to your sister's death? Her eyes showed surprise. Oh, what will you do then? She did follow the victims. I didn't answer. Tell me first. 
Irene Feng was a student my sister sponsored from high school to college for five years, lifting her from a remote village to a city with endless opportunities. But human greed knows no bounds. Seeing the city's splendor, her gratitude turned to resentment. She felt she deserved this life and wanted more, even my sister's place. She wanted to replace my sister. So, she secretly contacted Edward Norton, meeting my sister one night and giving her a drink. As the woman spoke, my hand trembled, not from fear, but from the injustice. She was right. Irene Fang was a snake, killing the farmer. Her death would be the best tribute to the farmer. And today Irene Fang never intended to let me leave alive. And dear. I dragged Irene Fang to a deep pit on the construction site, yet to be backfilled. I didn't know why she chose this place, probably thinking no one would find it. But she must have forgotten that the construction site was my domain, and I could find enough materials to let her sleep here forever. As I moved her, she woke up, her mouth opening and closing weakly eyes full of fear. But I silently pushed her down. If there's a hell, let the devil meet in the underworld. Covering her with rubble, I found a few unopened bags of cement and poured the mixed cement into the pit until it submerged her entire body. After finishing covering the pit, I looked at the mysterious woman calmly. Is it over? Who's next? I'll help you till the end. <laughs> From her story, I felt there was one more deeply hidden character that Irene Fang wanted to replace. And with Catherine Zhou dying two years ago, Irene Fang's lavish lifestyle must have been supported by someone else. The true mastermind was likely behind the scenes. As I suspected, there was indeed an instigator behind the whole story. It was Catherine Chen's husband and Irene Fang's lover, Rowan Luo. If Irene Fang's story was like the farmer and the snake, then Rowan Luo was the wolf in sheep's clothing. Catherine Jewel and the mysterious woman were orphans. Their parents died in an accident when Catherine just came of age. Fortunately, they were well off leaving enough inheritance to live comfortably. Rowan Luo was originally a young driver for their parents. After the family tragedy, he helped Catherine through the hardest times, and she gradually relied on and developed feelings for him. A few years later, when the sister went abroad to study Rowan Luo, and Catherine Ju finally got married. The mysterious woman thought this was a happy ending. But it was the beginning of a nightmare. After gaining control of the finances, Rowan Luo grew cold towards Catherine, and worse, he got involved with Ai Wen Fang, whom Catherine was sponsoring. As Catherine's sister began to sense something wrong, she urged her to divorce Rowan Luo. But Catherine's long standing feelings for him were not easy to let go of. During this torment and hesitation, Catherine found out she was pregnant. She confronted Rowan Wu, hoping he would change and start over. But since Ai Ring Fang had already latched onto Rowan Wu, how could she easily let go? Thus, the most brutal plan unfolded. It's unclear who suggested involving Edward Norton, but Rowan Wu certainly knew and supported Ai Ring Fang in paying off Edward's blackmail. Catherine Zhou eventually committed suicide, giving up her place. Rowan Luo must pay the highest price. Listening to the woman's complete story felt like falling into an ice cellar. No wonder the woman told me her time was limited. This whole chain would unravel once someone fled, so she had to eliminate everyone quickly. The next day, I called Rowan Luo. Mr. Rowan. 
I have Irene Fang. He said, what are you talking about? I don't understand. If you've done something illegal, I'll call the police. I knew he would be called the police. He had worked hard for nearly 10 years to get his position and wouldn't throw it away. I said, don't pretend. Irene Fang told me everything about you too. Also, I have something you might be interested in. He hesitated. I suspect you're blackmailing me. I said, there's a video about your wife. No, your ex-wife. You should know it, right? He asked who I was. I said, I was Edward Norton's co-worker. He claimed not to know Edward Norton, saying his wife died two years ago, and asked me to stop bothering him. Laughable, knowing his past, his shamelessness, didn't surprise me. If you're not interested, I'll give the video and Irene Fang's confession to the police. Mr. Rowan, I'm just a laborer seeking money. My life is cheap, but you're different. Do you think the police won't link its death to you? Scamaching. Skinky scale. Mm. He seemed to move to a different place. I heard a door slam, then his true face emerged. He cursed me for being untrustworthy, saying he already gave me $10,000 now. I was threatening him again. I said, you should know Fane brought things. She shouldn't. It's your dirty deeds first. I'm just collecting interest. He asked how much I wanted. I said $200,000 for Iron Fang's life. And your future. He demanded proof of Irene Fang's safety. I said, do you have a choice? Tonight, no matter how, you must bring the money. I had no time. Irene Fang's death could be exposed any time. So I had to trick Ron Lu tonight. Robin Luo chose the same old place. Probably with the same plan as Irene Fang to finish what she couldn't. Late at night, car headlights pierced the darkness. Roland Lulu got out, carrying a case. I wore a safety helmet and mask, covering most of my face. He said, I have the money. Where is the person? I said I needed to see the money first. He opened the case full of neatly stacked dash bundles. He said it was time to see the person. I said she was upstairs, asking him to give me the money and go up to get her. He wasn't foolish enough to hand over the money, staying guarded. Bring her down. I'll wait here. Wait here. Who knows who's here? Why not say, wait at home? What do you suggest? She did follow the victims. She did follow the victims. Pretending to ponder, I said, follow me up neither of us leaves the other side. Ridiculous. How do I know you have no ambush upstairs? Mr. Rowan, I'm just after money. Why ambush you? Do you think I need help to split the money? This matter is a secret we both want to keep. Once you see her, I get the money and leave. Why stay for your revenge? He hesitated, still thinking. I believe this money won't hurt you. Once I have it, we won't meet again. You won't chase me for a little money. I won't stir trouble either. Besides, if I wanted to harm you, here's enough. Running is easier. Moving you upstairs would be redundant. My last words seemed to convince him. He scanned around, confirming no one else, and nodded. To show sincerity, I threw him a flashlight, equipped helmet. We turned on the lights and entered the building. He let me lead following from a distance. Both of us stayed on guard. 
keeping our distance. In hindsight, Irene Fang underestimated the situation by coming alone. Maybe previous deals with Ed gave her false confidence. Even feeling I an outsider would be less cautious. She might have wanted to prove her independence to Rowan Law. Regardless, she gave me a chance, making me more careful. We reached the second floor. A pink electric scooter was at the stairway corner near scattered panks. He asked why the scooter was brought up. I said, should I leave it downstairs? Attracting attention. You're such a big boss. Don't make me carry it down again. He didn't say more, urging me to hurry. We climbed eight floors. He panted, asking where she was. I said, almost there one more floor. He rested, then shouted, Iron. No response, he warily asked what was going on. Then in confusion, I said, Do you think I'd let her run or scream? He kept staring, eyes darting, slowing down. I knew he'd go up. Just resting, regaining strength. Everyone had a common secret. Reaching the top meant action. I lit a cigarette, smiled, and climbed the last steps. He stayed close, a meter behind. From my peripheral vision, I saw his body tense, gripping the case, nerves taut as a drawn mull. Reaching the ninth floor, the light beam wobbled. The unfinished building structure was mostly in place, with no door frames, allowing a clear view into the rooms from the hallway. In the light, a chair at the room's bottom held a woman, tied tightly to it, her head hanging hair, covering her face. Rowan Lowe rushed past me, knocking me aside. Caught off guard, I stumbled, watching him reach the chair, shouting, Irene, he drew a knife from the case's bottom, standing a step away from the chair, facing me eyes blazing. Now he had the upper hand. I couldn't threaten the woman behind him, so I approached slowly. Mr. Rowan, why rush? I'm not withholding her. Fumpy Doha, do you still have a say? His gaze locked on me. He retreated, nearing the chair, pressing the left side of the hair, covered head. No one upstairs come up ninth floor. Luan, Luau, what are you doing? You're playing dirty. Who are you to fight me? Soon I'll make you wish you were dead. Pretending to be angry, I glared at him as a smug expression spread on his face. Really haven't you? Checked the hostage. Just as he was about to smile, he froze, swiping the hair away. The wig fell revealing a mannequin in safety gear. Lon Lu didn't understand construction. Before dealing with Irene Fang, I dressed the mannequin in her clothes, making it look tied up, adding a wig for tonight. In the dim light, it was impossible to tell real from fake. Foam Lu's face twisted in rage, yelling, Where's Irene Fang? What did you do to her? I sneered, You two are really alike betraying without hesitation. She's already in hell. Enraged Rowan, Luo kicked over the chair, dropped the case, and charged at me with the knife. Think you can kill me? Not that easy. Wait, I'll make you share Catherine Zhu's fate. Her fate's so Catherine Zhou was your doing. Oh, Ski. Unconsciously, my voice trembled. You seem to realize something. Who are you? What's your relation to Catherine Zhou? I removed my mask, shaking with anger. 
I don't know who I am, but debts must be repaid. Did you kill Catherine, Joe? So, what? His face twisted in madness. Do you know what I sacrificed for my position? Was it to be tied to one woman? Mm. My eyes nearly bled. Don't you care about your child? Child, I can have as many as I want. I tell you, don't think you've won. I planned for Einmarine's possible death. It's fine as long as I have money. Women will follow. Once I kill you, no one will loan. This 200. Zero, zero, zero buys your life. All who know the secret will die. So will you. I felt cold, sinking into a dark abyss. But my mind cleared. You think calling people was unexpected. Footsteps echoed from below. I smiled grimly at Roland Lou, pushing a large stone I had prepared. The building's stairwell was hollow. The stone fell with a rush, then a crash, followed by an explosion. Below flames flickered. Yes, I had rid the scooter's battery. The lithium battery exploded, igniting the planks, blocking the way up. Rowan Lu was stunned, not expecting a laborer to outsmart him. As he faltered, I lunged, grabbing his knife hand. We struggled crashing against walls and floors. He was taller and stronger, finally pinning me, the knife tip over my chest. You think you can beat me? His face red and twisted with teeth clenched. I fought to hold the knife, but it edged closer, less than an inch away. Do you know how Catherine Joe died? His eyes were bloodshot, mouth widening in a cruel grin. She stood on the balcony, asking why fate was cruel. She cried, looking at me, waiting for comfort. But I just stared coldly, saying maybe even the heavens didn't want her. She glared at me, like you are now then, said I. Wasn't worth it. But I waited so long for this chance. I couldn't let it go. I rushed everyone saw me, as if to save her, but I pushed her. No, join her. I always knew who you were. I... His words were killing blows. I roared, twisting, slightly, thrusting my shoulder into the knife. The blade pierced my shoulder and my helmet smashed into his face. In his moment of pain, I drew a syringe strap to my leg and stabbed his neck, hearing the liquid hiss injecting it all. Irene Fang had taught me, this fighting, the strong with their methods. Wu and Lu went limp before he could resist. I pushed him off gasping on the floor. Pulling out a recorder, I ended this, a requiem for Catherine Zhou. Afraid to remove the knife fearing blood loss, I used my last strength to drag Lo and Mu to the balcony. The balcony was an open platform, overlooking everything below tiny people, firelight, and car lights. It was lower but enough for him to feel Catherine Joe's despair. Rowan Nui's eyes were open, his face pale. He finally faced his end. I adjusted the dose. The drug would weaken, but not kill the best gift for a villain. I half hung well and Lua outside. He couldn't speak his eyes pleading. Haha, so you can cry, too. A bright light from below, a voice shouted. I recognized it as Tony Tal the policeman. You can reach, Domon, can you chin? It's over. Don't do anything foolish. She did follow the victims. Over, I never believed in salvation or forgiveness. Blood deaths are paid with blood. His death won't bring your sister back. 
don't. Clear, be there. A shadow fell like a meteor. I'm Tony Tal, a policeman. A few days ago, a brutal murder occurred in my jurisdiction. The victim was found in a seedy hotel bed, gruesomely killed, with a towel in his mouth, limbs tied to the bed, and abdomen slashed open. Strangely, a teddy bear was stuffed inside his stomach. We searched the scene, but found no clues, so we started identifying the victim. His name was Edward Norton, with prior convictions for rape and molestation and frequent minor offenses, currently working at a construction site. We initially suspected revenge, but none of his victims had the opportunity. We went to his work site, finding his roommate, Ethan Wu, to learn more. Ethan Wu gave a strange impression, though working on the site, his demeanor was not typical of manual labor, with a gloomy aura. Co-workers mentioned his habit of talking to himself, as if mentally troubled. Ethan provided an alibi, which we verified. Though the timing was loose, he had no motive, so we excluded him. With no leads, the case stalled. We checked Edward Norton's bank account, finding periodic large deposits, far exceeding his wages. Following these leads, I suspected unexposed crimes involving Edward Norton. A breakthrough came three days later. Josh found a video on a porn site during a data search. It showed Edward Norton drugging and raping a pregnant woman, Catherine Joe. We searched for her, finding she had committed suicide two years ago, three months pregnant, leaking rape, suicide, pregnancy, and a teddy bear. I felt Catherine Joe was central to Edward Norton's murder. We investigated her connections, finding three suspects, a sponsored student, Irene Fong, her ex-husband, Rong Du, and her sister Claire Joe abroad. I went to Irene Fang's school, finding her missing. Classmates said she left early, unreachable. However, Irene Fang never mentioned Catherine Joe, avoiding her sponsored status. The most suspicious part was Irene Fang's continued to lavish lifestyle post Catherine Joe's death, with no jobs or scholarships. Who supported her? In Irene Fang's social media, we found clues revealing her long-term affair with Rowan Luo, even before Catherine Joe's suicide. Regrettably, Prasmate reported Irene Fang missing since last night. To avoid alerting them, we investigated and tracked Rowan Lu, noticing his odd behavior. He withdrew 200 and gathered some thugs for unknown purposes. We followed him to an abandoned housing area, meeting a masked man entering a building. As we debated action, Claire Ju's details came through. Claire Jell was tall and strong for a woman. After studying abroad, Catherine drew a suicide. She took a leave of absence, underwent gender reassignment surgery, and got a new identity through underground channels. Seeing the new name solved the mystery. Rowan Bull's intentions and his grave danger were clear. Claire Ju was Ethan Wall. We rushed upstairs, finding Ethan Wu, pushing Roy and Lu off the ninth floor platform. I shouted, Ethan Wu, stop. It's over. Don't do anything foolish. In the interrogation room, the police asked my name. I was dazed, and Ethan Wu, why do they call me Claire? Tony Tao sat across frowning silently at me. What was there to say? My task was done. I saw the mysterious woman standing by Tony Toe smiling saying, well done. She said, I completed my mission, avenging my sister. 
she smiled through tears, merging with me. I remembered everything. I'm Claire. I abandon everything to kill those three, to be with my sister. I told Tony tell my last wish. After my death, bury my ashes beside my sister, so I can always protect her, as she protected me. Tony Tao didn't respond for a long time, then slightly nodded. I said thank you. Closing my eyes, I saw myself lying on the grass, with my sister gazing at the sky. The sky was so blue, so blue,